Good morning. Um, I'd like to uh, begin by giving some thanks to the people who helped make today happen, uh, beginning with Chris and Mark Lambert, who in the background conceived this idea and began driving it uh, maybe six months, a year ago. And then who, the people who actually made the meeting happen, uh, beginning with Leah Caracapa, who's here somewhere. Leah, thank you. And, uh, and uh, our two um, scientific directors, um, Sangeeta Shivan and Peter Olofsson, who you'll be hearing from during the day today. So thank you, Peter, Sangeeta, and Leah. I have uh, brief remarks, no slides, and I'd like to just frame the vision of this meeting as the opportunity to be a participant in a revolution. Napoleon said, revolutions can't be created, nor can they be stopped. And one can witness them or participate in them. And looking at what's happening now uh, is extremely exciting, because I think we are uniquely positioned to both witness and participate in a very important revolution that, that will be to the benefit of mankind. Um, I've been very lucky to witness a few revolutions and to participate in a few also. Um, I was very small when Sputnik was launched. I was a baby when Sputnik was launched. But I remember in school practicing duck and cover drills because of the fear that the Russians were going to drop nuclear bombs from Sputnik. Bruce is laughing because he remembers. It was an amazing time, but it was quickly followed by JFK's promise to take a man safely to the moon and back before the decade was out, which was a galvanizing event in the United States and launched, in many ways, the technology and scientific investment that led to all of you being in this room. Uh, it, it led directly to the major investments in molecular biology and molecular medicine that we enjoy today. And it obviously led directly into investments in technology, which are so celebrated today. And so I wasn't a participant in that revolution. I was too young. Um, nor did I participate in 1968, although maybe Bruce participated in that one. <laughs> but the effect of that has been very, very long-lasting long and, and very impactful. And when you look today at where we are presently, we, as a scientific community, are heavily invested in molecular medicine and molecular biology. The investments in molecular medicine and molecular biology have changed the way medicine's practiced, changed our view of the world, changed our understanding of science. But with this recent economic upheaval, there have been major changes in scientific funding in the United States. In fact, currently, we're living through an era of NIH contraction, which is uh, essentially a 20% contraction of spendable money, of real dollars, fr from 10 years ago. So there's been a major cutback in the investment on the classic molecular medicine, molecular biology track from the government, from the NIH, and from other funders. But you, are, you can't pick up a newspaper or turn on a radio or a TV today or look on the internet without reading a story about investments in technology. There's a huge, we're living through an era of huge, hugely expanding investments in technology. And what this meeting is about is where those two intersect. What this meeting ab about is, is developing devices and technologies which utilize all of the advances and mechanistic understanding that we have derived from molecular biology. I think that the groups, the institutions like ours that are positioned to lead this effort at the point of the spear where molecular biology meets technology will be creating a new future are participating in a revolution. The, another revolution that, that I was a participant in was the idea of targeting cytokines to treat disease. Um, my colleagues and I gave the first dose of monoclonal anti-TNF to a baboon in a treatment model and prevented the animal from having shock. And, and, and that monoclonal antibody arguably launched what we now call biologics, $30 billion plus business. And what's amazing, thinking about how it happened, was it didn't feel like a revolution. It just felt really exciting. I don't know what a revolution feels like, actually. But, but it felt really exciting, because nobody thought it would work. Nobody was talking about it. 
The word biologics hadn't essentially been invented in, in the context of using antibodies as drugs. And even when it worked in the um, animals, animals with infection, nobody really predicted it would work in auto-inflammatory diseases and rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, but it did. And even when it worked in those diseases, there wasn't a rush to the store to buy these things. The, the, there was tremendous adoption hurdles and barriers. So this revolution, was, in retrospect, was actually quite quiet. You know, the, the, we, we, we published the Nature paper describing monoclonal anti-TNF in 1987. Mark Feldman published his papers showing the effect of anti-TNF in the early 1990s. Drug sales for biologics took off in the mid-1990s. The word biologics was coined in that time. And all of a sudden, it's in every clinic and every hospital. But the world's a very different place. And, and, it's, and it, that is exciting. And, I, and it, to close, what, I, what I'd like to, to plant in your mind's eye today is the idea that this revolution of making devices based on molecular mechanisms that we understand to replace drugs or to replace biologics is an achievable goal led by people like you and it will be it will change the world it, it you know, we're talking it, it is very plausible based on available data today to think about putting in devices that are virtually side effect free that are cheaper than drugs and that can be put, controlled with much more precision anatomically, uh, temporally, and even potentially um, with speci with, uh, by specificity. So are there, th there's very few examples of this, right? The, 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 mo the, the devices that are currently used are either structural, valves, stents, hips, knees. I think the last time I looked, there were 250,000 people in the United States with hardware that is not structural, so these are electrodes, these are deep brain stimulators. And you could actually expand this to, how many of you know that, that the FDA has approved a device, which is essentially a TV camera that can let blind people see? How many of you don't know that? You know, yeah, half the room. This is an informed audience. It's an approved device. This is not the future. This is yesterday. A TV camera that can make blind people see because it takes the visual information and puts it into a, uh, uh, what do you call those dots? Um, huh? An array or, or, or a grid, uh, just like you see on your screen. And that pixels, that's what I was looking for, those pixels are actually uh, re-encoded into electric information, which is fired into the brain, and the brain figures it out. Once the electrical information gets in, these people can see, as long as their occipital cortex is intact. Similar stories for hearing. I mean, how many people know that there are now exoskeletons that could be controlled by the patient's own thought to move paralyzed limbs? Most of you, I think, have heard that. This is, this is old news. There's an Israeli company now going, seeking approvals for this. How many of you people know that, a comp that you can train, you can train a, uh, a computer in like an hour to map a subject's brain in high fidelity while the subject watches a series of unrelated YouTube videos. And then with 24 hours of supercomputing from that training, you can play new videos to the patient. And the brain will, 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 will see the videos, and the computer will process what the brain sees and show you a video that you can actually see the elephant in the video, you can see the airplane. And you can, see the br you can see the computer regenerate the YouTube video with the brain of the patient as the intermediary. That's been done. So what's really exciting to me as we've delved deeper into this is to realize we're in the middle of a revolution. There's a lot of things that have already been done that are not catching on because it's a quiet revolution. But I don't think we're going to be able to stop it. And so I hope that this group, together with us, will help us lead it. Thank you. This meeting was fantastic. Um, I think it exceeded um, all of our expectations. And I want to begin by thanking all the pre presenters from uh, beginning to end. Um, this was a great day. So thank you to the speakers first. Um, I, I think 
almost all of them are still here, um, and which is amazing in itself, given the difficulties of time commitments and scheduling and clinical commitments and research and grant commitments. So, so my gratitude to that is sincere. I think um, to, to some of you, um, it may be a bit of a surprise uh, how all of this fit together. Um, it's not to me, and it's not to the other organizers of the meeting. Um, the, only, um, the only caveat I could add to that is that this is not an all-inclusive representation of the expertise in the health system on this space. I mean, I, I can't name all the other people who could have equally well been on this program and contributed synergistically with everything that happened here today. But just to name a few, because it's important, uh, John Kane is looking at compliance in psychiatric treatment by studying pills that transmit um, to computers uh, to track um, when the pill hits the stomach acid. Uh, this is, again, this is not the future. This is past tense. He's been doing this. He is doing it. It's really important. It's, and compliance is a huge problem, not just in psychiatry. Raise your hands. How many of you have taken all of your antibiotics for 10 days without missing a single pill? Nobody. No. Uh, Mark says yes. <laughs> I don't believe it. I want, you, you went to the study. Um, we could have included Ona Bloom doing work on uh, her favorite animal, the lamprey, and looking at uh, uh, inducing um, healing of spinal cords. We could have included Valentin Pavlov looking at his work in sort of the brain circuits that descend from the top down to regulate the output of these, um, of these reflex controlling circuits. We could have included five more people. Anybody else obvious? Raj, Chris, Mark. I mean, there, there's a there's a deep there's a deep team of expertise that's positioned in this health system, um, as the centricity series always is. That it's a largely health system centric um, meeting, typically on a topic to understand within the health system and within the Feinstein where our own strengths reside. At, amplified and highlighted by outstanding experts from elsewhere. And I want to take this minute to thank Professor So from flying from Santa Barbara and giving such an outstanding lecture today. And, and looking ahead, um, it, I, I do see a, an opportunity for us to lead this space. And I don't just mean in here. I mean in New York, if not the world. And that space being broadly defined by, by where we develop a molecular biology mechanistic understanding of how to use technology in a very precise way. You know, um, this was not a vagus nerve meeting. Um, we have a lot of depth on that team right now. We spent a lot of money over a lot of years. I mean, uh, Raj's line about, let's do this in three months, and then seven years later, we're almost there. Um, you know, the, the, the project that Yakov Levine presented so beautifully from Setpoint was written on the back of a napkin 15 years ago, and it's not done. Um, you know, in this, the, way, the way regulatory and um, regulatory mandates line up, the way financing mandates line up, the way um, human nature is to change adoption behavior in the clinic, and even adoption behavior sometimes in a lab or in a clinical trial design, to get something done in 10 or 15 years is now fast. It's a different conversation whether that's appropriate or not, or whether we should all be working on changing the process. But that's part of our opportunity, too, is figuring out, you know, what are the things that we can do more efficiently, more quickly uh, to shorten those timelines. It's amazing, um, as much as we know about the molecular biology and the very sort of um, detailed mechanistic um, knowledge that we have in this one circuit, I think what wasn't said enough today is that there's, I think a few people mentioned it, but there's a hundred of these circuits. There's a thousand of these circuits. You know, we're studying one because it's important to capture scientific credibility. It's important that we completely understand one circuit. And then, but there's going to be hundreds, if not thousands, of these circuits. Many of them will be potentially exploitable therapeutically. So for everything, there's still a disconnect on, the, on this spear. The point of the spear is dull today. Because although we're really heavily invested in the molecular biology knowledge and mechanisms and understanding and lots of science and nature papers to prove it, the devices, you know, with all due respect, Yakov and I have talked about this, the devices has been, has been um, described by many as crude, you know. 
the, de the device, it, it, the new one is, is cool. The pod is, is amazing. But, but the idea of wrapping, uh, stimulating, even the pod, stimulating the entire nerve is essentially crude when we have technology available to stimulate a few axons at a time, you know. And do we need to? I mean, in the case of, of, of the rheumatoid arthritis study you saw, you could argue that it's actually not that crude because Yakov and his team figured out with Jared Houston starting the way years ago that you only need to stimulate a very small subset of fibers. And to do that electrically means, although the device may be on the whole nerve, you're only stimulating, we think, a very small fraction of the fiber. So there is some sophistication there, but that's not the point. My point is the technology is, is way behind is way behind the molecular biology understanding, and that's the opportunity we have. In Professor Miller's um, closing lecture, which, which is brilliant for the opportunities that it opens, among other things, you can imagine we're really understanding in more detail those circuits would still require developing new devices to capitalize on the knowledge that, that would come out of those mechanistic understandings. I think this is, this is what we're thinking of as bioelectronic medicine. Uh, so in closing, I want to thank you again, but I want to tell you that we are well down the path towards a, um, investing very heavily in the health system in this space. Uh, you could argue that over the years, uh, we and others have built the Research Institute and the Research Enterprise on the tried and true model of molecular medicine and molecular biology mechanisms. But, it's that, but in the current era, there's it's time to rebalance the portfolio. Uh, we don't need to shut things down, and we don't need a draconian overthrowing of our current model. That's The model's working. The, the institute and the research enterprise and the health system is doing great. But we need to be looking forward at investing in the technology side of the equation, because that's where the tremendous growth opportunities are. And the, and the best growth and the leadership in this place will come from the groups like here, where we can continue to do the great molecular medicine, but but develop devices that, that, that capitalize on that. And, and I think, you know, I, Dan Grandy bought a 3D printer and hopefully he's going to be printing knees or ankles or whatever he's going to be printing soon or kidneys. I mean, th this, is, this, is, this is today, you know. There are, um, there's an entire institute at Harvard now that studies the fact that if you could take a stem cell and if you put it on a pulsatile surface that has the, that has the contraction, the mechanical surface itself has the contractile features of a colon, then it differentiates into colonic epithelial cells. And if you put it on a, on a tensile surface that feels to the cell like an arterial wall, it differentiates into an arterial endothelial cell. And if you put it on a tensile, I, I, I sat on a stage at Rockefeller in Casbury Hall with the guy who runs this institute for four hours. I mean, my mouth is hanging open. And it, if you put it on a, a, on a tensile surface that acts like a lung, it differentiates into, either into a pulmonary alveolar lining cell or a pulmonary um, uh, endothelial cell. I mean, you can't make this up. And, and he's arguing that this is going to replicate organs, because you can build the organ now, right? You can, you can build the cells layer by layer and start with stem cells and end up with all the cells lined up in the right way to look like a bowel wall or a lung wall, with or without. And you can pump the blood underneath, right? So you can have the air on the top, the alveolar cell, and then the cells differentiated into um, endothelial cells by pumping blood through them. He's, they've done all this. And I said, well, what about the nerves? You still don't have an organ if, if one cell can't have an axon-axon reflex from another cell 10 cells away. So I think the opportunity for us to, to jump into this space is huge. I think this is just the beginning. And um, with that, I think we're having a reception outside. And, uh, and I invite everybody outside and to, to continue the conversation. Thank you. <laughs>